Number 15. The Murder of Eros Diaz On the night of June 22, 2019, a little past 9.30 p.m., a tragic incident rocked quiet Winship Street in Hartford, Connecticut. The shooting death of 24-year-old Eros Diaz from Avon, an incident which also caused life-threatening injuries to a second man in his early 30s, sent shockwaves through the community. The immediate aftermath was chaotic. Upon arrival, authorities found Diaz already deceased in a car, while the second victim was urgently rushed to Hartford Hospital. Earlier that evening, Diaz's car was involved in an accident on Gilman Street and subsequently fled the scene, only to halt on Winship Street. The driver of the other vehicle remained at the crash site. Close to Diaz's car, detectives discovered a NASA baseball cap and multiple 380 caliber shell casings, pivotal evidence in the ongoing investigation. A breakthrough came from surveillance footage, still unreleased to the public, which showed an individual, believed to be the shooter, walking north on Winship Street from the Winship and Gilman Street intersection. This same individual was noticed by the driver from the earlier accident wearing a hat during his northbound walk but was hatless while fleeing south post-shooting. One significant account came from a witness who had heard a man named Gino McMahon speak about the incident. McMahon allegedly admitted to being in an altercation with two individuals named Tooth and X and alluded to committing the shooting in retaliation for X allegedly shooting his brother. The witness further shared that McMahon referred to the weapon he used as his baby, identifying it as a 380 caliber pistol. In a shocking revelation, McMahon confessed to leaving behind an item at the crime scene that might incriminate him, specifically mentioning a black NASA hat. After years of painstaking investigations, uncertainty, and heartbreak for the family of Eros Diaz, 2023 marked a pivotal turning point reigniting hope for justice in this cold case that has haunted the streets of Hartford since 2019. McMahon's arrest ensued four days after a separate witness, reportedly acquainted with McMahon for 14 years, implicated him as well. This witness claimed that on that fateful night, he had seen McMahon running and firing shots. Yet, McMahon's involvement remains under scrutiny. While the NASA cap seems to be the very item McMahon claimed to have left behind, DNA analysis from the State Forensic Science Laboratory deemed the genetic material on the cap too intricate to match McMahon's DNA. Another lab went on to exclude McMahon as a contributor entirely. The case's unique nature, marked by the discrepancy in DNA analysis, has led to an impending hearing on September 28th, where the court will determine if there's adequate evidence to proceed with McMahon's murder prosecution. Besides the murder charge, McMahon faces charges for first-degree assault related to the second shooting victim who survived his injuries and illegal possession of a handgun. He remains in custody on a $3 million bond awaiting trial. Number 14. The Opalika, Jane Doe On January 28, 2012, a young boy found a small human skull while playing behind his house in the Brookhaven Trailer Park in Opalika, Alabama. After his family spoke with the police, investigators discovered more remains in the nearby woods. Close to a creek, a pink shirt with heart-shaped buttons and ruffles was discovered, though detectives weren't sure if it belonged to the same person. An autopsy showed that the child victim had suffered over 15 fractures all over her body from apparent blunt force, injuries which had healed by the time of her death. This death was ruled a homicide. The medical examiner also believed the child, known as Baby Jane Doe, might have been undernourished and possibly blind in her left eye due to an eye socket injury. She likely passed away between the summer of 2010 and 2011, based on forensic analysis. Detectives worked diligently to raise public awareness of the unidentified girl's case, sharing a composite sketch on billboards throughout the southeast as well as making the image available online. The public was urged to come forward if they believed they could identify the girl, with emphasis on the tragic nature of her untimely death. Despite extensive efforts, including DNA testing against missing person records, no leads emerged, and the investigation stalled in a matter of months. The young girl was referred to by investigators and in the media as Opalika Jane Doe. Four years later, in 2016, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released updated images of the girl. These images, crafted by a forensic artist, 
using facial recognition technology, showed her with an eye deformity, as observed in her autopsy, and with short braided hair, as some braids were still intact when her remains were found. Shortly after these images were publicized, a pivotal lead emerged, a photo from 2011 taken a year before the discovery of Opelika Jane Doe's remains. A former summer Bible school teacher from the Greater Peace Church in Opelika provided investigators with pictures, suspecting one girl who appeared in them to be Opelika Jane Doe. Yet, even with the photos, they couldn't find any records of her in the church or at the school. This girl in the photos had a distinct left eye deformity, hair styled in tight curls, and wore unkempt clothing, resembling the earlier released composite of Opelika Jane Doe. The teacher remembered her as a reserved child, not mingling much with her peers or speaking to adults. This new evidence was the strongest lead yet, but without any records, investigators turned to the public. They urged anyone who remembered this from the Bible school to come forward. This plea was amplified through a social media campaign and an escalating reward, which began at $5,000 and increased to $20,000 for anyone who could identify her. Investigators were baffled by the fact that a distinctively featured young girl could vanish seemingly without being noticed. Earlier attempts by the Opelika police to derive a DNA profile from her remains were fruitless due to their degraded condition. However, a decade after the initial discovery, in January 2022, the remains were sent to Othram's laboratory in Texas. There, scientists successfully extracted DNA creating a detailed genealogical profile of the young girl. This profile was subsequently added to a genetic database where investigators hoped to find potential relatives. For further expertise, the police engaged Barbara Ray Venter, a noted genetic genealogist, and her team at Firebird Forensics Group to sift through the data and provide valuable investigative leads. In October 2022, a decade after the discovery of the deceased child's remains, DNA analysis identified Opelika Jane Doe's father. Lamar Vickerstaff Jr., a 50-year-old native of Opelika, had traveled extensively due to his Navy career, but eventually settled in Jacksonville at the Naval Station Mayport. When they notified him of his daughter's fate, investigators were taken aback by his indifferent reaction and his refusal to acknowledge her. His wife, Ruth Vickerstaff, also claimed to be unaware of the child. However, with the DNA evidence now strengthening their case, the investigators persevered. They successfully identified the mother as 37-year-old Sherry Wiggins, who verified that she gave birth to a daughter in January 2006. The once nameless child was finally identified as Amore Jovea Wiggins. From the age of three, Amore resided with her father and stepmother, having been legally placed under their care in 2009, while Sherry's parental and visitation rights were terminated. Although Sherry kept up with child support payments, she lost contact with the vicar staffs and hadn't seen Amore for many years. Upon digging deeper, investigators found that Amore had never attended school in the vicar staff's locality, and surprisingly, her disappearance had never been reported by the family. On January 17, 2023, Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff were arrested in Jacksonville, Florida. Lamar faced charges of felony murder and neglecting to report a missing child, whereas Ruth was charged only with the latter. Both were detained at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, pending their transfer to Lee County, Alabama. At a preliminary hearing held on March 22, 2023, Detective Alfred White shed light on the details of the vicar staff's police interrogations. Ruth confessed to having been dishonest during her initial arrest due to her confusion about the unfolding situation. She recounted her struggles with caring for Amore and mentioned that she had last seen her when she asked Lamar to hand Amore over to his relatives. Tragically, it was noted that an acquaintance of Ruth had previously reported noticing injuries on Amore before her death. Lamar, during his questioning, admitted to taking Amore's life, but refuted the claim that he was the one guilty of inflicting the injuries identified on her remains. He described his desperate attempts to resuscitate her after the tragic event, trying to bring Amore back to life. He further pleaded for Ruth to be absolved from charges related to Amore's death. Post-hearing, Lamar was not granted bail, while Ruth, on the other hand, was released on bail 
returning to Jacksonville with an ankle monitor. Both are still awaiting trial. Number 13. The Murder of Destiny Pittman The small town of Kokomo, Indiana is known as the City of Firsts and is renowned for its low crime rate. However, tragedy struck the usually peaceful town in 2013, leaving the community in shock. Born on January 9, 1992, Destiny Renee Pittman was a radiant presence known for her dazzling smile and captivating personality. Having just purchased her first home and making moves towards her dreams of a modeling career, Destiny seemed on the brink of a promising future. On the night of February 7, 2013, however, at 9.33 p.m., a desperate call led Kokomo police to 815 James Drive. There, they discovered a devastating scene. 21-year-old Destiny had been fatally shot, with her lifeless body surrounded by evidence of a violent break-in. Despite the presence of her boyfriend and roommate in the house, alongside two children and three dogs, two intruders had reportedly brazenly stormed in. Disturbingly, amid the chaos, Destiny faced the robbers and was shot dead, her life tragically cut short. The intruders fled without a trace, leaving behind a single bullet casing and a community grappling with the reality of cold-blooded killers on the loose. As the investigation unfolded, clues emerged, suggesting the attack might have been drug-related. Destiny's boyfriend admitted to the couple's involvement in the marijuana trade, but specified Destiny had stepped back after a recent inheritance. He even mentioned relocating a stash of drugs and money shortly before the incident. However, leads were scarce. The only vague description of the assailants came from Destiny's roommate, who, based on their voices, believed them to be African American, but later conceded they could have been white. By 2015, with the case growing colder, authorities could only confirm the full cooperation of the boyfriend and roommate. Time moved on, but for Destiny's family, her home remained untouched, a haunting reminder of that tragic night in 2013. The aftermath was devastating for Destiny's family. Her mother, Carla Pittman McCombs, preserved everything in Destiny's house as a heart-wrenching tribute, with even the bullet hole remaining. Carla, profoundly impacted, expressed her devastation and hope for someone to come forward. Destiny's stepfather, Steve McCombs, noted Carla's immense struggle with the loss, while her father, Douglas Jr., shared his dwindling hope and longing for the culprits to confess imagining that they'd eventually feel the weight of their actions. Another family member poignantly remarked on the irrevocable loss, emphasizing the need for closure. The Kokomo Police Department, led by Captain Teresa Galloway, continuously emphasized the ongoing nature of the investigation, encouraging any information from the public. Yet, silence persisted until 2021 when the police made a renewed appeal to the public, stressing the still open nature of Destiny's case and imploring, if you know something, say something. In December 2022, a breakthrough came in Destiny's case when a woman contacted the Kokomo police. She had been holding on to information, hoping the case would resolve itself, but felt compelled to come forward after years of seeing press releases. The woman revealed that the perpetrators were Jesse McCartney, 36, and Joey McCartney, 32. She had been with the brothers that night in 2013, waiting in a jeep outside Destiny's home as they broke in. The woman said that, after she heard a loud noise from the residence, Jesse emerged from the home with a bag of marijuana and cash, looking visibly shaken, followed by Joey. The woman's story was given validity when she identified Destiny's house, and police were also able to verify the McCartney brothers' whereabouts. Destiny's boyfriend recognized Joey, having possibly seen him at their home previously. Armed with this new evidence and the long-standing investigative work, arrest warrants were issued for the McCartney brothers. On March 2, 2023, Joey was apprehended in Kentucky, and Jesse was arrested in Kokomo just two hours later. They faced multiple charges, including murder, robbery, and burglary. Records showed that both brothers had prior run-ins with the law. Joey had a misdemeanor battery charge from September 2012, which was dismissed in 2014 after he completed a diversion program. Similarly, Jesse faced a battery charge in 2012, upgraded to a felony due to the victim's profession, but it was later dismissed, and records were destroyed in 2016. At their preliminary hearings in March 2023, 
Both brothers pleaded not guilty and were held without bond. Jesse's trial was set for August. After a decade-long mystery surrounding the murder of Destiny Pittman, the McCartney brothers finally faced trial. However, the outcome was unexpected for many. Jesse McCartney, 36, stood trial first. But the case against him was not as concrete as some might have expected. In less than 90 minutes, a jury decided to acquit him of the charges of murder, robbery, and burglary related to Destiny's death. The swift decision surprised many, but several factors contributed to the jury's decision. Lana Hunt, who had previously served as a detective with the Kokomo Police Department, testified in defense of Jesse. She clarified that during her tenure on the case, the McCartney brothers were never viewed as likely suspects. This revelation undoubtedly cast doubt over the prosecution's narrative. Adding to the challenges faced by the prosecution was the testimony of an Indiana State Police firearms examiner who expressed reservations about the ballistics evidence. The case also suffered from an absence of crucial pieces of evidence, with no DNA, fingerprints, or cell phone records linking Jesse to the crime scene. In the aftermath of Jesse's acquittal, the focus shifted to Joey McCartney, the other brother. Joey was set to face trial shortly after Jesse's verdict on August 15. However, in light of recent developments and perhaps re-evaluating their approach, the state requested a continuance. A judge approved this request, postponing Joey McCartney's trial until December 5, 2023. Destiny's family and loved ones are still waiting to see if justice will be served a decade on. Number 12. The Murder of Colleen Rice slash The Mojave Jane Doe In January 1971, hunters stumbled upon a woman's remains in a desert spot off Hackberry Road, located roughly 2.2 miles from U.S. Highway 93. The body was encased in a white cotton sack, secured at its opening with a white cotton rope. The unidentified woman was believed to be in her mid to late 30s, stood at 5'4", and weighed around 125 to 140 pounds. She was dressed in a multicolored long-sleeved blouse, marked size 14, paired with a black cardigan and burnt orange stretch pants. A label inside the pants read, Symphony, It's What's Happening, size 12. Additionally, she wore black leather ankle boots and what seemed like once white bobby socks. Although she wore no jewelry, an imprint on her ring finger indicated she likely wore a wedding ring often. Distinct features included her curly dark brown hair, sprinkled with gray, a pronounced scar on her abdomen, resembling one that would result from a cesarean section, and her meticulously maintained nails. It was also observed that she wasn't a smoker. Following the autopsy, it was determined that the woman had been strangled to death. Detectives were fervently piecing together information to identify the victim and apprehend her murderer. In their quest to identify her, her fingerprints were dispatched to the FBI in Washington, D.C. Moreover, her detailed dental work, which was valued at an estimated $2,100, including a notable $500 micro-band bridge, was highlighted in dental publications throughout the United States. Authorities hoped that a dentist might identify the intricate and expensive dental work. The woman was believed to have been murdered around the conclusion of December 1970's hunting season. Consequently, all 5,000 bow hunting applications from that period were reviewed. Additionally, married hunters were questioned and asked to present their wives to verify they could be accounted for. To help with the identification process, an artist from the Museum of Northern Arizona crafted a sketch based on the characteristics of the victim's skull. This depiction emphasizes her prominent dark eyebrows and broad smile. The police appealed to the public, urging anyone who might recognize the face or had any knowledge about the event to reach out to the Mojave County Sheriff's Office, SIU Division. Investigators combed through records kept by local accommodations like hotels and motels, interviewed workers at local stores, and reviewed missing person reports from four states, Arizona, California, Nevada, and Utah. Regrettably, despite these intensive endeavors, the woman's identity remained a mystery, causing the investigation to stall and the case to turn cold. In 2022, half a century after the discovery of the victim, the Mojave County Sheriff's Office's cold case unit joined forces with the private DNA lab, Othram, to harness the capabilities of advanced DNA testing and forensic-grade genome sequencing in their quest to unveil the woman's identity and shed light on her tragic end.
To propel this mission forward, the Mojave County Sheriff's Office donated $1,000 and rallied the community, encouraging their assistance in achieving justice and peace for the family of the deceased. Othram initiated a crowdfunding campaign, through which the community swiftly raised the remaining $6,500 needed for the investigation within a mere five days. Using the funds, state-of-the-art DNA tests and genetic genealogy research were conducted, with the results being authenticated via DNA comparison with a relative of the victim. Several months later, in January 2023, the mystery surrounding the Mojave Jane Doe was finally solved. She was identified as Colleen Rice, born in Portsmouth, Ohio, on March 17, 1931. Colleen Audrey Rice was the child of James Rice and Flossie Truitt. As she grew, Colleen went on to study at Portsmouth High School, and her youthful visage, captured in a prominent photo from this case, depicts her flashing a bright smile. At the tender age of 16, in 1946, she tied the knot with William Davis. However, as time wore on, Colleen's ties with her family weakened, and the details of her life post-adolescence remained largely unknown. Now, even though Colleen's identity has been reclaimed 52 years posthumously, a new mystery was created. What happened to her? Authorities are still on the lookout for the person responsible for her death and are trying to piece together the events leading to her tragic end in Arizona. Those with any insights about Colleen Audrey Rice or the circumstances of her death are encouraged to reach out to the Mojave County Sheriff's Office, SIU, at 928 753 0753, extension 4408. Number 11. The Murder of Cynthia Ruth Wood. Cynthia Ruth Wood, a 33 year old resident of Bradenton, Florida, carried the title of a loving mother with great pride. The year was 1984, and Cynthia was embroiled in an emotionally charged custody battle against her husband, a man with alleged abusive tendencies. On a fateful day in June, Cynthia believed she had found an ally in Donald Santini, thinking he held crucial information that could tip the custody scales in her favor. He had reached out to her promising crucial information that could help her win her case. However, her trust was misplaced. Donald Santini wasn't a man of integrity, he had a concealed, sinister past that included a conviction and was actively evading charges for aggravated robbery in Texas. The very act of placing her faith in Santini would tragically cost Cynthia her life. Only five days after being seen with him, her body was tragically discovered in a Riverview drainage ditch. Strangulation, the autopsy revealed, was the gruesome method used to take her life. The determined investigators made headway when fingerprints lifted from Cynthia's remains pointed directly to Santini. Yet, while the evidence was clear, Santini, crafty and elusive, seemed to disappear into thin air, and so began a nearly four-decade manhunt. With aliases ranging from Charles Michael Stevens to Donald Chapman and even John Trimbleon, he was a chameleon on the run. There was widespread belief amongst investigators that Texas, a previous stomping ground for Santini, was his chosen hideaway. Fast forward to 2023, and a tip changed everything. In a twist few saw coming, the fugitive was not hiding in Texas, but was nestled in San Diego County, California. This crucial piece of information led the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force directly to Santini's doorstep, marking an end to his extended run from the law. Renowned forensic expert David Thomas of Florida Gulf Coast University, in discussions with ABC Action News, shed light on the importance of forensic evidence in the case. Citing Locard's exchange principle, he underlined the probability of Santini leaving incriminating traces at the crime scene. Today, with Santini behind bars and technology having made advanced leaps and bounds since 1984, the Hillsborough Sheriff's Office is fervently re-evaluating the evidence. With his extradition to Florida in the pipeline, there's a palpable hope that the long-delayed justice will soon be served, bringing a semblance of peace to Cynthia's grieving family. Number 10. The Murder of Nancy McKeevers In January 1983, a tragic incident unfolded in the Durham neighborhood of Washington County. On a chilly morning at 10.38 a.m., deputies from the Washington County Sheriff's Office were dispatched to a residence on Southwest Rivendell Drive 
in response to a 911 call from 30-year-old Randall Randy McKeevers, who claimed that his wife, 28-year-old Nancy McKeevers, had taken her own life. When the authorities reached the scene, they discovered Nancy with a critical gunshot wound to her head. Despite swift action by the EMS, who attempted life-saving measures before rushing her to a nearby hospital, Nancy couldn't be saved and was declared dead. At the time of the tragic event, only Randy, Nancy, and their one-year-old son were present in the house. Randy's account of the incident raised eyebrows almost immediately as he provided two varying descriptions of the events leading up to the fatal shot. The first version was that there was a struggle over the gun, but Randy wasn't sure who hit the trigger. The second was that Randy walked in on Nancy shooting herself with no time to stop her. Given the inconsistencies in his statements, a team of detectives was summoned to conduct a thorough investigation. Their efforts were bolstered by the participation of the Washington County Medical Examiner's Office, the Oregon State Police Medical Examiner's Office, and the Oregon State Police Crime Lab. In their in-depth investigation back in 1983, the detectives utilized forensic tools to gather vital evidence, subjected the gun to testing, and had an autopsy conducted. The findings challenged Randy's claim of pointing towards a different sequence of events. As the noose tightened, Randy became uncooperative by April of the same year. But with evidence running dry and no other leads to pursue, the authorities were compelled to suspend the case in August 1983, marking it as cold. Fast forward to August 2022, when the Violent Crimes Unit decided to breathe new life into the unsolved case. Their determination led to the unearthing of several new leads over the next few months. The Forensic Science Unit of Washington County Sheriff's Office reviewed old evidence, and the Oregon State Police Crime Lab affirmed the 1983 lab results, which ruled out the possibility of As part of this renewed investigation, detectives took the statements of over 20 individuals, including those from the law enforcement and emergency response teams who were present at the 1983 crime scene. The noose tightened once again around Randy, who was now residing in Tigard, when detectives brought him in for questioning in January 2023. In that re-interview, Randy said he went to hypnotherapy to forget that day due to the trauma and could not confirm any of the statements he had previously made. But, before any legal proceedings could take their course, Randy ended his own life on February 8, 2023. In an unreleased side note found by detectives at the scene, Randy denied responsibility for his late wife's death. However, Detectives believed they had their killer, just that it was too late to bring him to justice. They gave statements to the media that the case was now closed and that they were able to conclude that Randy killed his wife in 1983 because she planned to leave him. Number 9. The Kidnapping of Melissa Highsmith Melissa Suzanne Highsmith was born on November 6, 1969, in Fort Worth, Texas to parents Jeff and Alta. Shortly after her first birthday, Melissa's parents separated, leaving her mother, Alta Apantenko, now left with the responsibility of single parenting. Seeking to rebuild her life, Alta, along with her close confidant Carol, moved into an apartment. To make ends meet, she took up waitressing and with shared custody of Melissa between her and Jeff, child care was a pressing concern. It was one fateful summer afternoon that Alta, in a bid to find reliable child care, placed an advertisement in the local newspaper. Much to her relief, a seemingly kind-hearted woman named Ruth Johnson responded to the ad. The two arranged for an in-person interview at the restaurant where Alta worked, but Ruth never showed up. The next day, however, she called back with an apology, painting a warm picture of her home, complete with three children, a spacious yard, and a swing set. Swayed by Ruth's apologetic tone and her description, Alta decided to offer her the babysitting job over the phone. The agreement was for Ruth to pick Melissa up from Carol the subsequent morning. What happened next would haunt Alta for decades. On the agreed-upon day, August 23, 1971, Ruth arrived at the Spanish Gate Apartments to fetch Melissa. 
Carol, upon later discussions with the police, recollected Ruth's distinct appearance, white gloves, sunglasses, and an old-fashioned bonnet, quite out of place in the scorching Texan summer. By evening, when there was no sign of Ruth or Melissa at the agreed-upon pickup spot, Alta's initial worry escalated into panic. Repeated attempts to contact Ruth went unanswered. The realization that something was terribly wrong hit hard when the authorities, after an initial probe, revealed the chilling fact that Ruth Johnson was a fabricated identity. The investigation into Melissa's disappearance was expansive. Two predominant theories surfaced. One suggested that a woman, driven by her own loneliness or maternal desires, had abducted Melissa. The other painted a more sinister picture, theorizing a male culprit had disguised himself to commit the heinous act. Despite these leads and Alta's heartfelt pleas that were aired on local news, the whereabouts of Melissa remained a mystery. The years that followed only thickened the plot, with three separate women approaching the police, claiming to be the lost Highsmith child. DNA tests, however, dashed those brief sparks of hope. In a twist, the shared grief and love in the ordeal of losing their daughter saw Jeff and Alta reconcile. They remarried in 1973, going on to have three more children. As the years passed, the shadow of Melissa's disappearance lingered, leading the Highsmiths to take up the mantle of sharing the tale of the sister their children never knew. As adults, the siblings continued to search for Melissa, employing both time-honored methods like flyers and modern tools such as social media. Meanwhile, only a short distance from her biological family, Melissa spent the majority of the ensuing 50 years with the moniker Melanie Miyoko residing in Cowtown, a mere 10-minute drive from the Highsmith residence. Melissa's recountings depict an isolated and unloved childhood, shielded from the broader world, purportedly because of alleged brain damage. In 1984, at the age of 15, Melissa, known then as Melanie, decided to flee the life she knew. Subsequently, she moved to Charleston, South Carolina, a long way from her original Texas home. Almost 40 years later, on November 6, 2022, Jeff Highsmith's journey into his genealogy, using 23andMe, revealed a match. Living just 17 minutes away, all along with her husband, John, and their children, was his daughter. 51 years after he had last seen Melissa, he reached out to her through Facebook. Despite her initial skepticism, considering it a potential hoax, familial markers, such as a unique birthmark, convinced her siblings and other family members that they had indeed found their long-lost Melissa. While the legal window for prosecuting child abduction had closed two decades after Melissa turned 18, law enforcement remains committed to uncovering the full story. In 2023, DNA tests concluded that Melissa was indeed the missing baby. 51 years later, the search for her was finally concluded. Today, she's navigating the new reality of reconnecting with her birth parents, four siblings, and a host of nieces and nephews. Among her wishes is to relive her wedding day, this time with Jeff accompanying her down the aisle. Number 8. The Murder of Heidi Furcus Heidi Furcus, a resident of St. Paul, Minnesota, was a loving and devoted wife to her husband, Nick Furcus. According to the Mercury News, their love story began in church, where they first met, leading to a marital journey that lasted four and a half years. At the time of her death, Heidi was associated with Securian, a financial services company, while Nick held a role as the director of operations for a carpet cleaning enterprise. The tragedy unfolded on April 25, 2010, when a 25-year-old Heidi faced a brutal end. She was shot dead in the very home she shared with Nick. A distress call made by Heidi to the police captured the grim moments leading up to her death, including the sudden silence following the sound of the gunshot. While Heidi's life was tragically cut short, Nick survived the incident with a gunshot wound to his leg. He presented a version of the events that involved an intruder, a scuffle, and the subsequent shots that injured him and killed Heidi. Nick also revealed to the investigators that even before this tragedy, the couple were grappling with financial turmoil, with an imminent eviction looming over them. Despite this narrative, the case saw little progress in terms of finding a perpetrator, remaining unsolved for years. However, inconsistencies began to appear in Nick's account, 
evidence at the crime scene didn't support his story of a break-in. To further cast shadows of doubt, the shotgun involved in the incident, which was found at the scene, bore only Nick's DNA. Eleven years after Heidi's murder, in May 2021, a significant breakthrough came when Nick was arrested. He faced charges of both first- and second-degree murder. The prosecution built a case around the couple's financial challenges, suggesting that Nick, driven by desperation and the weight of their monetary problems, took his wife's life to escape the perceived shame. The judicial process culminated on February 10th, 2023, when, after a 10-hour deliberation, the jury pronounced Nick guilty on both counts of murder. A subsequent sentence, delivered on April 13, 2023, condemned Nick Ferkus to life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. While this verdict brought a legal conclusion to Heidi's tragic story, Nick, now 40 years old, continued to proclaim his innocence, emphasizing that he would maintain his stance to his dying breath. Number 7. The Murder of Jeremy Jerry Watkins Jeremiah Matthew Watkins, who was known simply as Jerry, was a boy of simple pleasures. With brown eyes that shimmered with mischief, he adored Kit Kat chocolates, the freedom of riding his bicycle across West Virginia's undulating terrain, and singing along with the classic, old-time rock and roll. His family remembered how eagerly he anticipated getting to witness his infant sister's first steps, a milestone he would never get to see. On November 12, 1985, the town was left shaken when the body of 13-year-old Jerry was discovered in a shallow grave near the town's railroad tracks days after he was last seen. Autopsy reports revealed that Jerry suffered a traumatic blow to the head, which caused a brain bleed, but that his ultimate demise was due to a stab wound in the back. Jerry's gruesome death was a shock to the tight-knit community. The boy was known for his sweet disposition, and for him to have been found brutally beaten and fatally stabbed was unfathomable for many. The local authorities, despite their efforts, were left with more questions than answers. Jerry's bereaved family was further tormented by the lack of leads. His mother, Enid Nicola, and younger sister, Jamie Cole, struggled with the void left by Jerry's abrupt departure. After nearly 40 painful years full of dead ends, a break was finally made in the case in February 2023. Captain Travis Ticknell of the Preston County Sheriff's Office, driven by a mix of professional duty and personal interest, decided to re-examine the cold case files. His keen eyes detected inconsistencies in the statements given by 56-year-old David Monroe Adams, who was 18 at the time of the murder. A deeper dive into the past revealed that Adams had once confessed to the crime in 1985, but later recanted, leading investigators at the time to dismiss him as a suspect. However, upon being interviewed again in 2023, Adams admitted to the crime for a second time. He detailed a disagreement with the victim over a stolen bicycle which escalated, culminating in Jerry's death inside a shed. David Monroe Adams, a resident of Westover, Virginia, has now been charged with second-degree murder in connection with Jerry's killing. His arrest, after almost four decades, has evoked a torrent of emotions within the Watkins family. Jamie Cole, Jerry's sister, lamented the life Jerry never got to live reflecting on long-ago memories of a brother she barely got the chance to know. While no conviction can truly heal the wounds of the Watkins family, the possibility of closure after years of heart-wrenching uncertainty offers a semblance of solace. The tight-knit community of Terra Alta, and the broader public too, now await the courtroom proceedings, hoping for justice to be duly served for the innocent life tragically cut short. Number 6. The Disappearance of Kayla Unbahan Kayla Unbahan, from South Elgin, Illinois, found herself at the center of a heart-wrenching mystery when she was declared missing at just nine years of age. South Elgin, a town located approximately 45 miles northwest of Chicago, was the place Kayla called home before her sudden disappearance in 2017. In July of that year, Kayla was reported missing, as investigations deepened, the primary suspect emerged to be none other than her mother, Heather Unbahan. Ryan Iserka, Kayla's father, shared in a 2018 video for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that the courts had granted him full custody of Kayla earlier that year. This decision came after Heather's continued inability to adhere to previously established court orders 
concerning their custody agreement. Heather and Kayla had allegedly embarked on a camping trip that July, from which they never returned. Disturbingly, when Iserka went to Heather's residence in search of his daughter, family members claimed ignorance about the whereabouts of both Heather and Kayla. Netflix's popular series Unsolved Mysteries played a pivotal role in Kayla's case. While Kayla's story wasn't the primary focus of a 2022 episode, the show featured a photo slideshow on still missing victims of parental abductions. Images of both Kayla and Heather were displayed briefly at the episode's conclusion. This fleeting moment was serendipitous. A vigilant store owner in Asheville, North Carolina, having seen the episode, recognized Kayla at a local shopping center. The Asheville police were promptly alerted. Following the tip, officers reached the Westgate Regional Shopping Center and encountered a young woman who matched Kayla's description. Callahan Walsh, of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, emphasized the crucial role media can play in cases like Kayla's. Even with long-term missing cases, consistently publicizing the stories and images of missing children increases the odds of their safe recovery. As a result of the store owner's keen eye and the tip-off he made, Heather Unbahan, now 40, was arrested in Asheville. Following her arrest, she managed to post the $250,000 bail set for her. While she hasn't been formally charged, officials allege her involvement in child kidnapping due to her breach of a court directive. She has been restricted from exiting Illinois without court consent. Her hearing was arranged for June 29th, but no further updates have since been released. Reunited with his daughter, Ryan Iserka expressed profound gratitude through a statement on the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's social media. He acknowledged the irreplaceable role played by the Bring Kayla Home Facebook page's followers in maintaining awareness of Kayla's case. The family now seeks privacy as they begin to rebuild their lives and bonds. Number 5. The Murder of Sarah Yarborough in 1991, the serene Pacific Northwest backdrop of Seattle, Washington, was tainted by a grisly discovery. Two teenage boys, with their skateboards tucked under their arms, were traversing a grassy field as a shortcut to a grocery store when a harrowing encounter changed their lives forever. A man mysteriously emerged from the tall grass, and the trio momentarily engaged in a silent stare-down before the mystery man hastily departed. When one of the teens curiously examined the spot where the man had been hiding, the lifeless body of a young girl was found. She was soon identified as 16-year-old Sarah Yarborough, who had left home earlier that day for a drill team competition. Sarah's short life had ended in violence. She had been strangled with her own pantyhose, which remained twisted tightly around her neck. Her struggle with her assailant was evident. Scratches and blood from her attacker provided precious DNA evidence. Her vehicle was found parked at Federal High School, and its examination painted a harrowing picture. She had likely been abducted from the parking lot and then led to the murder scene. Sarah wasn't just a statistic or a headline, she was a bright, caring, and dedicated individual. As captain of her drill team, she had gone out that morning, ready to ensure her teammates were ready for the competition. The news of her death came as a soul-crushing blow to her family and friends when they were informed shortly after her body was discovered. The two boys who had first encountered the scene provided the police with a detailed description of the man they had watched emerge from the area where Sarah's body was found. Their account described a man with a distinct mullet haircut, striking blue eyes, and noticeable scars or acne along his jawline. While the community remained vigilant and the perpetrator's DNA was cataloged in both state and national databases, no matches or leads surfaced over the next few weeks. The weeks turned to months, and before Sarah's loved ones knew it, decades had passed. The chilling mystery of Sarah's murder had become a haunting cold case. The two boys, now grown men, carried the weight of their grim discovery throughout their adult lives. The turning point arrived in 2019 when the King County Sheriff's Office decided to revisit Sarah's case, initially seeking the help of genetic genealogy due to the strong DNA evidence. They instead found a match in a state database connected to a felon's brother, 59-year-old Patrick Leon Nicholas. Nicholas was no stranger to a life of crime. In 1983, he was convicted of abducting and assaulting Anne Crony, 
menacing her with a knife before she narrowly escaped by plunging into a river. Although sentenced to 10 years, Nicholas served just three. Had he completed his original sentence, Sarah Yarbrough would never have become his victim. Detectives began to trail Nicholas, and from discarded items like a cigarette butt and napkin, confirmed his DNA matched that which was found on Sarah. Nicholas was swiftly arrested. His 2023 trial saw his defense attempting to undermine the DNA evidence and question the credibility of the two witnesses. But justice prevailed. The jury found Nicholas guilty, sentencing him to 45 years in prison for Sarah's murder. For many, the resolution brought a semblance of closure, yet, the haunting question remains. For a man with a notable history of violence, how many more victims might there be? The search for answers continues as law enforcement investigates potential connections between Nicholas and other unsolved cases. Number 4. Boy in the Box In the winter of 1957, the discovery of a young boy's lifeless body in a box rocked the city of Philadelphia and haunted the community and the country for the decades that followed. Situated in the quiet Fox Chase neighborhood, the tragic find quickly snowballed into a national mystery that left many hearts heavy. Dubbed the Boy in the Box or America's Unknown Child, this case posed more questions than answers. The grim discovery was first made by a muskrat hunter named John Stachowiak and subsequently corroborated by Frederick J. Bononis, a man with a somewhat questionable reason for being in the area. The boy, a white child with pale features and sandy blonde hair that appeared freshly cut, was estimated to be between three and six years old. His blue eyes, which should have been animated with childhood curiosity, told a story of prolonged suffering, one of malnutrition, abuse, surgical scars, and trauma the evidence of which forensics teams uncovered as they examined his small body. Despite the tireless work of law enforcement, which included tracing the origins of the box from a J.C. Penney store, distributing flyers with the boy's likeness, and even enlisting the media to broadcast the case nationwide, the child's identity frustratingly eluded them. The community, equally invested, mourned the boy's tragic fate, contributing to funds for his proper burial and memorial. However, as with many cold cases, hope flickered anew with the advent of new technology. The burgeoning field of genetic genealogy breathed new life into this decades-old mystery. Against all odds, in 2022, the boy was finally identified as Joseph Augustus Zarelli. Born on January 13, 1953, Joseph was from a distinguished family in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. The DNA breakthrough was made possible by a distant relative who, perhaps innocently wanting to explore family history, uploaded their DNA to a public database. Through diligent investigative work, connections were made, leading authorities to the boy's true identity. With Joseph's identification came fresh leads. The narrative shifted from the quest to name an unknown child to an active homicide investigation. Though Joseph's biological parents, Augustus John, Gus, Zarelli, and Mary Elizabeth Betsy, nay Abel, Plunkett, have since passed away, the revelations surrounding his lineage provided a glimmer of understanding into his tragically short life. Public response was a poignant mix of relief and renewed grief. The community rallied together once more, this time to ensure Joseph's legacy wasn't that of a young John Doe, but of a boy with a name, a history, and a community that refused to forget him. In 2023, on what would have been Joseph's 70th birthday, the community came together to unveil a new memorial. The once anonymous grave, which simply read, America's Unknown Child, was fittingly updated to honor Joseph Augustus Zarelli, ensuring that future generations would know his name and story. The tale of the boy in the box serves as a powerful testament to the importance of relentless pursuit in the face of adversity, community solidarity, and the profound impact of emerging technology in solving age-old mysteries. Number 3. The Chester Hospital Baby Killer Lucy Letby was born on January 4, 1990, in Hereford, Herefordshire, in the United Kingdom. Growing up near the River Wye on Erin Avenue, Lucy was the only child of John, a furniture retail manager, and Susan, an accounts clerk. Lucy had a typical upbringing in her area, attending Aylstone School, and later, Hereford Sixth Form College. 
She worked part-time at the W.H. Smith Bookstore and was known by friends as a diligent and focused student, often referred to as one of the geeky girls. She and her close-knit group referred to themselves as a mismatched family. Drawn to nursing early on, Lucy pursued this passion at the University of Chester. Known for her commitment, she often prioritized her studies over socializing. As part of her education, she trained at Liverpool Women's Hospital and the Countess of Chester Hospital. By 2011, she officially began her nursing career at the latter. Celebrating her graduation, her parents proudly shared a message in the local newspaper that read, We are so proud of you, after all your hard work, love mom and dad. In her early years as a nurse, Lucy was described as deeply devoted to her job. She once articulated her role stating, I care for babies with various needs, some short term, others longer, and I find fulfillment in seeing their growth and supporting their families. Additionally, Lucy was the face of a campaign aimed at raising $3 million for a new children's unit at her hospital. Beyond work, Lucy had a penchant for salsa dancing and cherished her two cats. Throughout her life, she remained particularly close to her parents, Susan and John. However, June 2015 marked the first in a disturbing series of events that took place in the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The month started optimistically with the birth of fraternal twins, Child A and Child B. Unfortunately, Child A's health deteriorated rapidly on the 8th, despite being initially healthy. He tragically passed away due to an air embolism. Devastated, Lucy texted a colleague expressing her sorrow after witnessing the father's grief, saying, Dad was on the floor crying. It's just heartbreaking. Although she shared with friends her reluctance to return to the ward, she was back for her night shift just a few hours later. Child A's twin, Child B, faced a grave situation hours after her brother's death, showing severe symptoms. Although she was resuscitated, it was later found that there was the mysterious presence of air in her veins. Following these incidents, Lucy was temporarily removed from the intensive care unit to process her grief. Desiring to dive back into intensive care, Lucy expressed her feelings to her manager and later vented to a colleague via text about needing to work with sick babies to cope with her feelings and feel a sense of agency over the loss. They discussed understanding and navigating such tragic situations. Just a few weeks later, another alarm on the unit signaled distress for Child C, a boy born seven weeks prematurely. Despite initial good health, he suddenly died from artificially introduced air in his stomach. The cause remained unknown. After this event, Lucy texted her colleague about the unbearable pain of seeing another baby pass away and empathized with the grieving parents, lamenting the tragedies and heartbreak they faced. By June 22nd, tension was palpable among hospital staff. Their anxiety heightened when Child D tragically passed after air was found to have been introduced into her bloodstream, causing three collapses, the last of which was fatal. Odd skin discoloration added to the mystery. Lucy communicated the loss to a colleague via text, discussing the unpredictability of the baby's outcomes and musing on fate. Whispers of a curse permeated the Countess of Chester Hospital's neonatal unit. A place once resonant with hope now felt marred by dread and sorrow. The unnerving events led to staff speculations, and in one exchange, a nurse remarked to Lucy about the strange coincidences of the baby's deaths. The nurse's suspicions went unexamined, adding to the unit's growing unease. On July 2, 2015, a review of the three infant deaths was initiated. The findings revealed a common thread. Lucy Letby was the only one present during each death. Dr. Stephen Brary pinpointed this consistency, but it was uncertain whether he was accusing her. The possibility that Chester might have its own angel of death was chilling. Despite the alarming pattern, Allison Kelly, the director of nursing and deputy chief executive at the hospital, chose not to act, leaving Lucy unscrutinized despite looming suspicions. In August 2015, Child E, seven weeks premature, tragically died after his mother found Letby with him, who assured, trust me, I'm a nurse. Within hours, the baby perished due to an IV air embolism and trauma. The next day, Letby lethally poisoned Child E's twin, Child F, with insulin. By September, Letby targeted Child G, causing the infant severe lifelong disabilities. Then in October, she ended Child I's life by forcing air into the baby's stomach. 
By November 2015, the hospital noted a rise in neonatal deaths, which the medical director, Ian Harvey, considered typical. However, by February 2016, Dr. Brary's detailed review found that all incidents occurred during Letby's shifts, always between midnight and 4 a.m. Despite this alarming pattern, the hospital dismissed it as a coincidence. In March, concern escalated. Powell, the neonatal manager, informed the chief nurse, Allison Kelly, about Letby's ties to the deaths, but her urgent plea was met with silence, deepening the divide between the hospital staff and management. On June 24, 2016, after witnessing a series of tragedies, Dr. Brary urgently called for Letby's removal from the neonatal unit. However, some staff remained unconvinced of her guilt. The alarming incidents that month spurred panic-filled discussions among hospital personnel, all hinting at the possible internal threat. A concerned doctor explicitly urged for police involvement. Staff complained that top hospital management lacked the same urgency they felt around the deaths. The hospital's deputy leader quickly silenced the growing concerns, ordering an end to emails between staff related to the patient deaths. By month's end, the hospital's executive directors convened, weighing the implications of involving the police and discussing Letby's potential role in the loss of life. Concerns arose about the hospital's reputation and the dangers of starting a baseless inquiry against Letby. Chief Nurse Kelly sought advice from the Nursing and Midwife Airy Council about managing the situation and the possibility of police involvement, but no contact was made with the police. Instead, the hospital chose an internal approach, downgrading the unit and transferring critical cases to other hospitals. By late June, hospital executives Harvey and Chambers sought an external evaluation, inviting the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health RCPCH, to review the unit's practices. However, this review was limited in scope, deliberately excluding an investigation into Letby's activities or the unexplained deaths. When Letby learned of the suspicions, she displayed clear distress. Due to staffing issues, close monitoring was unfeasible, leading to her transfer to an administrative role. This change coincided with an end to the series of mysterious infant deaths. In September, with the RCPCH diving into its inquiry, Letby filed a grievance against the hospital, feeling unjustly accused. At the same time, the RCPCH's initial insights were unclear, pointing to a need for deeper examination. Alarmingly, not every death had undergone the routine post-mortem procedure. Even with multiple calls for a comprehensive investigation from experts, the hospital's top brass hesitated. When the RCPCH's preliminary report was ready, an edited version missing crucial links between Letby and the infant deaths was circulated, clouding the picture for many. By 2016's end, Letby surprisingly received an apology from Chambers, who was representing the hospital. Doctors like Brary and Jayaram, who had sounded the alarm, were now being sidelined, their actions dubbed unprofessional by the leadership. As the months wore on, both parties grappled for answers. By February 2017, media reports exposed the hospital's controversial infant death rate. Under public scrutiny, the hospital's higher-ups, though hesitant, involved the police in May 2017, initiating Operation Hummingbird. The climax came in July of the following year. Letby was arrested. Chilling fines at her residence included documents about the departed infants and handwritten confessions hinting at her remorse. I am evil, I did this. There are no words, I am an awful person, I pay every day for that, I can't breathe, I can't focus. Right now, overwhelming fear panic, I'll never have children or marry, I'll never know what it's like to have a family, no hope. I haven't done anything wrong, police investigation forget slander, discrimination, victimization, all getting too much everything taking over my life, hate myself so much for what this has. I feel very alone and scared. What does the future hold? How can I get through it? How will things ever be like they used? Hate, panic, fear, lost. I don't deserve to live. I did this. Why me? I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough for them, and I am a horrible evil person. I don't deserve mum and dad. World is better off without me. In November 2020, Lucy Letby faced formal charges exposing to the public the maze of administrative reluctance and internal dynamics that had concealed a suspected killer 
within the hospital's walls for years. October 2022 saw the commencement of Lucy Letby's high-profile trial, accused of causing multiple infant deaths at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The case gripped the nation and sent ripples of disbelief through the medical fraternity. The perception of Letby shifted significantly as court sessions unfolded. While her defense argued that Letby was ensnared in an unfortunate sequence of events and implied doctor-led conspiracies against her, they also highlighted alleged poor conditions in the neonatal ward. They painted a picture of neglect and unsanitary practices that could account for, or at least contribute to, the tragedies that took place. Onlookers were struck by Letby's stoic demeanor throughout the trial. Encased in a glass-paneled dock, her reactions were minimal, even when confronted with detailed allegations of her purported deeds. Throughout the ordeal, her parents consistently showed up in support of their daughter. The prosecution's Nick Johnson KC commented on her seeming detachment, observing that her tears appeared more for her own plight than for the infants she was accused of harming. The trial of Lucy Letby took an unexpected turn when motives pointing towards a perverse hunger for attention came to light. Allegedly, her horrific acts were part of a scheme to catch the eye of a married doctor she was close to. This doctor, whom Letby described as her best friend, became a pivotal figure in the proceedings, with their relationship stirring speculation and intrigue amongst Lucy's colleagues and in the press. The pair's connection was undeniable, marked by frequent outings, shared meals, and late-night Facebook chats. While Letby insisted their bond was purely friendly, the affectionate tone of their interactions suggested otherwise. Their closeness prompted questions, especially when it was revealed that the doctor, despite maintaining anonymity for legal reasons, sent Letby texts appreciating her work and saying he'd trust her with his children. In a chilling theory presented by the prosecutor, Nick Johnson KC, Letby's malicious actions against infants were construed as deliberate crises crafted to engage this doctor both professionally and personally. The doctor's unawareness of Letby's sinister side was palpable as he continually praised her work, even with babies she'd allegedly harmed. Their relationship's darker layers unfurled when Letby's personal writings showcased sketches of love hearts, repeated mentions of his name, and sentiments like, I loved you, and I think you knew that. Her frequent online searches of the doctor's wife hinted at an obsession surpassing mere friendship. Prosecutor Johnson further insinuated that Letby might have orchestrated specific medical crises to secure the doctor's presence on the unit. Despite their shared past, their friendship dwindled by early 2018, a short time before Letby's initial arrest. However, the remnants of their connection and its implications were central to the prosecution's argument in the trial, raising unsettling questions about the extremes of obsession and the dire lengths Lucy Letby may have been willing to go for validation. After Letby's arrest, a wider investigation began, encompassing her stint at Liverpool Women's Hospital before her eventual role at the Countess of Chester Hospital. This extended inquiry supported numerous families impacted by the revelations, sparking significant apprehension regarding the NHS's surveillance procedures and the oversight of hospital administration. Questions arose about how Letby managed to evade suspicion for so long. A tense trial culminated in the jury, after 22 days of deliberation, convicting Letby for the murder of seven infants and the attempted murder of six others. During her subsequent sentencing, which she opted out of attending, the judge delivered a stinging indictment before declaring her penalty. You, over 13 months, snuffed out the lives of seven newborns and made sinister attempts on six others he declared. Some of these souls had been in the world for merely a day or a few days, their vulnerability paramount. Your actions represent a chilling, deliberate spree of child murder, targeting the most defenseless and knowing the significant anguish you were causing. He underscored the malevolent cruelty bordering on sadism in her deeds, stressing her unwavering denial and blatant lack of regret. You remain unrepentant, no circumstances are lessening the gravity of your actions. Given the unparalleled severity of your murders and attempts, the law mandates a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Lucy received 14 consecutive life sentences, joining the ranks of infamous serial killers such as Peter Sutcliffe, 
Myra Hindley, and Dennis Nilsson, she is condemned to spend her remaining years behind bars without any prospect of freedom, putting the mystery of the Countess of Chester Hospital killer to rest. Number 2. The Disappearance of Alicia Navarro Alicia Navarro was born on March 14, 2003, in Glendale, Arizona. Growing up with both her parents, Maria and Roberto Navarro, and two siblings, she enjoyed a childhood full of support and affection. The middle child, Alicia showed a profound interest in digital arts and technology from an early age. Close family and friends recall her being more reserved than other children, often found in her room tinkering with gadgets or engrossed in her favorite online games. Alicia would later be described as having high-functioning autism. By September 2019, the now 14-year-old Alicia was a student at Glendale High School. As the initial weeks of the new year rolled by, there were no immediate red flags or indications that something might be amiss. However, like many teenagers, Alicia spent a considerable amount of time online, connecting with friends and possibly strangers through various gaming platforms, and had begun exploring new hobbies like comic books and rock music, and also developed a keen interest in fitness, even starting to consume protein supplements. She showed a growing fondness for body sprays, makeup, and more daring outfits, as is the case with many girls her age. Her mother attributed these changes to the influence of Alicia's peers at school. On the 14th of September 2019, Alicia said that she felt overwhelmed and requested to skip school. Her mother consented, and they spent quality time together, grabbing Alicia's preferred meal from McDonald's, getting their eyebrows shaped, and indulging in some chocolates. That evening, Alicia immersed herself in online gaming, which was typical for her. Around midnight to 1 a.m., she stepped into the kitchen for water and before returning to her room, shared a heartfelt, I love you, with her mom. The following day, on the morning of September 15, 2019, Alicia's mother realized her daughter was missing from her room. She had left behind a note, briefly stating, I'll be back, I promise, please don't worry. Her personal belongings, including her mobile phone, were left behind. Surveillance footage from a neighbor's camera showed Alicia walking out of the family home around 3 a.m., seemingly in a hurry. Given Alicia's nature and the tight bond she shared with her family, her decision to leave was both shocking and out of character. The note raised more questions than answers, making the circumstances of her disappearance even more perplexing. The response to Alicia's disappearance was immediate, with local law enforcement getting involved to retrace the young girl's steps. The investigation initially focused on her close friends and acquaintances, trying to understand if any interpersonal issues might have triggered her abrupt decision to leave. As days turned into weeks, the scope of the investigation widened. Law enforcement began delving into Alicia's online life, given the significant time she spent gaming and interacting on digital platforms. This avenue brought to light various online relationships Alicia had formed, some with individuals whose identities were unclear or obfuscated. As days turned into weeks with no sign of Alicia, authorities intensified their search efforts. The local community rallied, hosting candlelight vigils and search parties to find Alicia. By November 2019, the FBI had joined the investigation, given the mysterious nature of her disappearance and its possible link to online connections. Interviews with close friends from school revealed that Alicia might have been conversing with someone online, but these leads were inconclusive. Despite extensive efforts, including media appeals and community search parties, Alicia's whereabouts remained unknown. Her family, distraught yet hopeful, made emotional appeals to the public, emphasizing Alicia's vulnerable nature and urging anyone with information to come forward. With every passing day, the hope of finding Alicia and understanding the circumstances that led to her vanishing act dwindled. On July 26, 2023, a surprising development emerged in the case. The Glendale Police Department confirmed that Alicia was located and was safe. During a press briefing, it was revealed that Alicia had recently visited a Montana police station and requested her name be removed from the list of missing persons. Notably, Alicia had turned 18 in September 2022. While the authorities mentioned the investigation was ongoing, early indications suggest that Alicia might have willingly run away and seemed to be in good health and spirits. It would emerge in the following days that Alicia had spent the past several years living with Eddie Davis, 
a 36-year-old who had recently been fired from a job at Walmart after he became very aggressive. After police concluded their investigations into Alicia's disappearance, the two fled to a Montana reservation together. Number 1. The Long Island Serial Killer the tranquility of Long Island's beaches and wooded areas are well known to native New Yorkers and visitors alike. However, for several years in the 1990s through the 2010s, they were the grim setting for a series of gruesome discoveries attributed to the work of a serial killer. On April 20, 1996, beachgoers on Blue Point Beach near Davis Park on Fire Island stumbled upon a macabre sight a pair of female legs, wrapped in plastic, with red-painted toenails. Authorities believed that she had met her fate a few months before she was discovered, found with jewelry, including a 16-inch gold necklace and two gold hoop earrings. Baby Doe's gender remains ambiguous, with some reports suggesting the baby was likely female. April 12, 2011, that more of her remains surfaced. Her skull was discovered off Ocean Parkway, west of Tobey Beach. A little over a year later, on June 18, 1997, in the dense woods of Hempstead Lake State Park, New York, a hiker made another horrific discovery, a female torso encased in a black plastic bag, housed within a large green Rubbermaid container. An intimate tattoo of a bitten peach adorned the left side of her chest, a poignant emblem of her identity and death. Notably, a C-section scar was evident. Nicknamed Peaches by investigators, she was presumed to be a black or mixed woman aged between 20 to 30. In 2011, more of her remains were found on Jones Beach, with two accompanying gold bracelets. On April 4, 2011, at a location that would become notorious as a suspected serial killer dumping ground along Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach, New York, police discovered another set of skeletal remains. The newest victim was an Asian male, aged 17 to 23, about 5 feet 6 inches tall, believed to potentially be a trans woman or a cross-dresser due to the women's clothing found with the remains, evidence of a musculoskeletal disorder, poor dental hygiene, and missing teeth provided additional clues about this individual's life. Named John Doe, their cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to the head, and the death was determined to have occurred between 2000 and 2006. Tragically, the same dumping ground yielded even more remains, this time, the bones of a small child. By 2016, DNA tests revealed the child to be related to Peaches and confirmed that she was that child's mother. Found with jewelry, including a 16-inch gold necklace and two gold hoop earrings, Baby Doe's sex remains ambiguous, with some reports suggesting the baby was likely female. The child's age was determined to be somewhere between 16 months to 4 years, with the date and cause of death remaining a mystery. Investigators and civilian sleuths began to suspect that these deaths might be related to one another. They began to speculate about a potential serial killer on the loose, just outside one of the most populated cities in the world, and many referred to this possible killer as the Long Island Serial Killer, or Lisk. The shadow of the Long Island Serial Killer grew darker with each new discovery. While many victims remain unidentified, more discoveries were made of victims whose names and stories could be told, adding more to the unfolding horror. Valerie Mack's remains were found on November 19, 2000, when hikers stumbled upon a woman's torso, nearly skeletonized, wrapped in plastic bags in the Long Island Pine Barrens in Manorville. Not much is known about Valerie, apart from the fact that she worked as an escort and lived with her boyfriend and young son. The mystery of her identity lingered for two decades until a breakthrough in 2020 reunited her with her name. It's a chilling reflection on the fragility of human connection that her disappearance went unreported and her family cannot be certain when they last saw her. The grim discoveries continued in April 2011, when more parts of Valerie, including her head, hands, and right foot were discovered in a plastic bag near Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach. Then there's the heartbreaking story of Jessica Taylor, a young woman whose journey led her to a life she likely never imagined. Leaving her Poughkeepsie home as a teenager, Jessica found herself in Brooklyn. Before long, she was working as a
shift worker, soon falling under the control of a pimp named Khalil Remy White. Her life was tumultuous, and she moved around frequently because of the nature of her work, but she expressed a desire to escape her circumstances during a trip to Washington, D.C. Jessica's sudden disappearance on July 15, 2003, raised alarms. When her car was discovered broken down en route to Brooklyn, and sightings of her at the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan were reported, hope surged that she might have somehow found her way back. Unfortunately, tragedy had struck. On July 26, 2003, a mutilated female torso was found wrapped in plastic in Manorville, New York. A distinctive tattoo helped to identify her. The tattoo depicted a red heart with an angel wing, bearing the words, Remy's Angel. Investigators recognized the mark as Jessica's. Just months after her disappearance, the remains were confirmed as belonging to Jessica Taylor. On May 9, 2011, the macabre discovery of a skull, hands, and forearm at Gilgo Beach ushered in another chapter in this harrowing tale. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, ex-worker often recognized by her aliases, Juliana or Marie, had a pattern of commuting between Manhattan and her Connecticut residence, offering her services online via websites like Craigslist and Backpage. The timeline of Maureen's final days in Manhattan is uncertain. While she typically traveled with a fellow for safety, referring to an accompanying male friend as their cousin, on the fateful weekend of her disappearance in 2007, she was seemingly alone. Her last known communication was a late-night phone call, mentioning an out-call meetup. Unsubstantiated reports suggest she was robbed outside her motel, possibly preventing her from meeting the client she had communicated with. Disturbingly, in the days after her disappearance, a friend received an eerie call from an unidentified man claiming to have seen Maureen in a brothel in Queens, though the caller never reached out again. The relentless search for Maureen ended in tragedy, with the grim discovery of her body on December 13, 2010, near Gilgo Beach. She had been strangled, and her body dumped in a story that was becoming all too familiar. An aspiring hairstylist from the Bronx, New York, Melissa Barthelemy's disappearance in July 2009 contributed to the growing mystery. Known to have recently visited a bank to deposit a significant check from her work as a worker, Melissa was set to then meet a client in Long Island. After her mysterious disappearance, her sister received a series of chilling calls from Melissa's own phone. The person on the other end was a man who claimed to be Melissa's killer. These calls could only be traced back to populous places like Times Square, only deepening the mystery, especially when records revealed her voicemail had been accessed from Massapequa, New York, on the day she disappeared. Her tragic end was confirmed on December 11, 2010, when her remains were discovered beside Ocean Parkway, another soul lost at the hands of the Long Island serial killer. Multiple attempts were made over the years to track down the Long Island serial killer, but, after bodies stopped appearing in 2011, leads became fewer and hope began to run out. That was until July 2023, when, in a shocking twist to the long-standing mystery of the Long Island serial killings, Manhattan architect and father of two, Rex Hoyerman, was arrested near his Midtown office. Footage from the scene showed him walking along a Manhattan road when he was suddenly encircled by plainclothes officers, ending years of speculation and dread regarding the identity of the killer. Rex Hoyerman, described by neighbors as a family man, resided in Suffolk County with his wife and two children. The president of the architecture firm RH Consultants & Associates, a company he founded in 1994, Hoyerman has a significant professional footprint. His firm boasts collaborations with major entities such as Catholic Charities, NYC Depth Sewage Treatment, and American Airlines, among others. Traces of his professional life began to be scrubbed swiftly after the arrest, with the company removing his profile from their official website. Raised in Massapequa Park, he is a graduate of Burner High School and has been a lifelong resident of Long Island. In a previous interview for his architecture firm, Hoyerman noted that he's been working in Manhattan since 1987. However, beneath the veneer of a successful businessman and family man, some knew there lurked a darker side, with some acquaintances branding him as creepy or arrogant. 
The momentum in the cold case took a decisive turn under the leadership of Suffolk Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, who, after rejuvenating the investigation, was aided significantly by technology. A Chevrolet Avalanche, registered under Hoyerman's name, was connected to a witness account from one of the disappearances. Investigators then served an expansive number of subpoenas and search warrants, leading to the discovery of cell phone records. These records tied burner phones used by Hireman to three of the victims. A hair, once considered insignificant due to older DNA technology constraints, was found on the burlap material used to conceal one victim's body. By 2020, technological advancements permitted its analysis, revealing Hoyerman's DNA. His involvement became undeniable after investigators matched this evidence to DNA from a discarded pizza crust investigators collected after tailing Hoyerman. Online behavior further betrayed Hoyerman's sinister tendencies. Accounts linked to him showed searches related to sadistic content, child pornography, and disturbing materials. Moreover, he seemed obsessed with the very case he was involved in, searching for questions about why the killer had not been apprehended. Furthermore, female hairs from the crime scenes were traced back to Hireman's wife, although her alibis placed her out of state during the murders. Following his dramatic apprehension, the legal process against Hoyerman has commenced. With the abundance of evidence stacking against him and the collective relief of a community yearning for closure, the judicial process is anticipated to be closely watched by both local residents and the global community. The path to justice for the victims and their families, after all these years, finally seems to be unfolding.